Hey there! You're watching Killer Bites, a show where we talk about all things true crime while cooking. Food and crime don't typically go together, but it's kind of nice to balance things out. In today's episode, I'm going to talk about Pam Hupp's many crimes while making roasted chickpea avocado salad. You can check out the recipe in the description below. This story is about one of the most twisted women to ever walk the face of the earth, Pam Hupp. She's believed to have slain three people in her life her terminally ill coworker, her own mother, and some random guy who suffered from a brain injury. Why? It's not super clear, but Pam jumped through so many hoops to try and cover up these crimes. She pretended to be lesbian lovers with her first victim, made it seem like her second victim suffered a bad accident, and disguised herself as a TV producer to lure her third victim to his demise. Yeesh. On the evening of December 27th, 2011, Russ Faria walked into his Missouri home to find his wife, Betsy, lying limp on the floor. One year prior, Betsy had been diagnosed with aggressive breast cancer that quickly metastasized to her liver and was deemed a terminal case. But that's not how Betsy passed away. When Russ came through the door, he found Betsy covered in puncture wounds that appeared to be from a blade. He then called 911 at 9.40 p.m. and told the dispatcher that Betsy ended her own life. When first responders arrived at the scene and laid their eyes on the 55 slashes that coated Betsy's arms, they thought otherwise. This had to have been an act performed by someone else. During their initial search, officials found another blade underneath a pillow on the couch Betsy was lying on and determined she had been lifeless for about an hour or so. After talking to friends and family of Betsy's, this is the timeline detectives came up with surrounding the event. That day, Betsy went to a chemotherapy appointment and then visited her mom. Betsy's friend and co-worker, Pam, gave her a ride home from her mom's house. Pam said she dropped Betsy off right around 7 p.m. and she was the last person who reportedly saw her alive. But get this, someone else was gonna drive Betsy home, but after Pam took her from her appointment to her mom's house, Pam demanded she let her drive her home later that night too. Interesting. Betsy's husband, Russ, was at a friend's house watching movies until 9 p.m. After that, he claimed to have stopped by an Arby's for two junior cheddar melts and then drove home to the crime scene. Right off the bat, Russ was at the top of the suspect list. Not only did officials think his 911 call seemed strange, but they also found a bunch of incriminating evidence on the guy. So right now I'm gonna season my chickpeas. I have oil, paprika, salt and pepper, and garlic salt. For starters, searchers found a pair of Russ's slippers in his closet that was stained with fluid. He was subjected to a polygraph test, which he failed, and interviewers also mentioned he was acting very suspicious during his whole interrogation. On top of that, it was discovered through Pam that Russ had a pretty violent temper and was a big drinker. It's believed that Betsy was considering a divorce because he had threatened her one too many times. There was even evidence on Betsy's laptop to confirm this theory. And with that, Russ was arrested for executing his wife. This was just one day after she was discovered. He was charged in January of 2012 and his court date was set for November of 2013. Don't you just love how long these things take? For real though, this crime happened in 2011 and the perp isn't going to court until 2013. What's the holdup? Well, when November of 2013 finally rolled around, here's what Russ's attorney, Joel, presented. A solid alibi backed by four witnesses who were friends that he visited during the time the crime went down. Proof that he bought a few things throughout the night to show that he really was out and about when Betsy was whacked. Joel also highlighted the fact that Russ had no fluid or DNA on his clothes or body that evening. The prosecuting attorney then tried to shut down all of those pieces of evidence by saying, Russ's friends must have lied to back him up. But it doesn't seem like she was ever able to explain the purchases he made. Those Arby's Junior Cheddar Melts don't lie, if you know what I mean. Aside from the proof that Russ wasn't the perp, his attorney also posed a new possible suspect, Pam Hupp, AKA the friend who dropped Betsy off at home that evening. Here's why Pam seemed to fit the bill for Betsy's attacker. 
On December 22nd, five days before the incident, Betsy changed the sole beneficiary of her $150,000 life insurance policy to Pam. It used to be Russ. Ooh, this is some tea. No one knew that Betsy changed the beneficiary on her policy, and Pam was currently working for State Farm alongside Betsy, which makes things seem even more sus. Hmm. If Pam worked at a life insurance company, that would mean she'd be pretty well versed in the matter. Pam first claimed that Betsy labeled her beneficiary and asked her to give the money to her daughters when they grew up. But later, she said Betsy told her that she was to keep the money all for herself. Okay, two things. One, why couldn't Russ give the money to Betsy's daughters? Technically, Betsy had them in another relationship, so they weren't his, but he could still pass the money along to them. And it's not like the daughters were Pam's either. Number two, why would Betsy switch up an important detail like that? That's such a strong claim to go back and just be like, oh, actually, Betsy's ghost visited me and said to cash in on this money. <laughs> What if? After the whole beneficiary thing was discovered, Betsy's daughters tried to claim the money from the life insurance policy, but their case was dismissed a few years later. Those poor girls. Not only do they lose their mother in such a tragic way, but now they don't even get a penny from her policy? I'd be Another thing the attorney Joel brought up about Pam was that she appeared to have been in close range of Betsy's house during the time of the crime. Phone records showed proof she was nearby for up to 30 minutes after she reportedly dropped Betsy off. Even after such a swaying presentation from the defense, the jury somehow found Russ guilty and he was sentenced to life plus 30 years in prison. Huh? What about the receipts? They're just gonna let Pam off the hook like that? Sometime after the sentencing, a team from the local Fox News station partnered up with a newspaper, St. Louis Post-Dispatch, to look over the details of the case again. You know, just in case the investigators missed something. During the review of the case, the team found a few more inconsistencies between Pam's statements over the months. They also did an article on the 911 dispatcher who was on the other line when Russ called that evening. The dispatcher said Russ was very hysterical and panicked on the phone, and it all sounded very genuine. But here's the juiciest gossip. The article also hinted at a relationship between the prosecuting attorney, Leah Askey, and the captain of investigations for the sheriff's office, Mike Lang, who was also an investigator on Betsy's case, and he went to court as a witness for the prosecution. Oh, this is rich. Now I'm gonna roast my chickpeas. Well, Russ's lawyer, Joel, eventually caught wind of this drama too. In fact, a printout of a scandalous email was anonymously sent to him. The email appeared to be from Leah to Mike, which pretty much confirmed the speculation. In the printout, Mike told Leah, this is not a puppy dog, crush on the hot girl in high school kind of love. This is an epic, stories are written about kind of love. I will do my best to be everything you need. I will do my best to be everything you need? Does that also mean you'll help pin an innocent man for slaying his wife? Joel also was sent a CD containing 132 photos from the crime scene that he had never seen. It seemed like the CD was sent from someone in Leah's office, but a handful of the images were blurry or completely black, which Joel thinks was purposeful. They must have been covering something up. With all of these sketchy things coming up, a judge finally ordered a retrial. This was in June of 2015. During the retrial, officials told the court that when Pam was interviewed most recently, she claimed that she was in a romantic relationship with Betsy. She said that that was why Betsy made her the sole beneficiary on her life insurance policy, and that would explain Russ's motive. Pam also later mentioned that she suddenly remembered seeing Russ in a parked car with another man. Yo, Pam is really reaching at this point. It was already near impossible for anyone to believe the claim that she was lovers with Betsy because most people said she was homophobic AF, but now she's trying to claim two same relationships. 
Dang, sis. Seems like you changed your beliefs quickly. Something else brought up during the retrial was the pair of slippers found in Russ's closet. At first, detectives thought the DNA evidence on the shoes was clear proof that Russ did it. But a CSI agent who searched the scene that day testified saying she didn't think the slippers were stained by stepping in Betsy's fluid that day. Well, in November of 2015, after months in court, it was finally decided that Russ was not guilty and his conviction was overturned. By that point, he had already served four years in jail. Ugh, that is so terrible. Between walking in on his deceased wife to being pinned for the crime, Russ's life really was turned upside down by this case. Russ ended up suing the officers involved in this case, as well as the county. He walked away with a $2 million settlement, which is a decent chunk of change, but it still sucks that Russ had to go through so much trauma by being punished for something he didn't do. After all was revealed, a bunch of other drama came out about the judge on the case. So she and the prosecuting attorney, Leah, were both voted out of office. Good riddance. Well, while all of this was happening in Betsy's case, there were two other cases that Pam was connected to. First up was the passing of her mother, Shirley. Back in October of 2013, Pam's mom, Shirley, was found lifeless in her apartment. Just like Betsy, Pam was the last person who saw Shirley when she drove her home. So Shirley had dementia and arthritis. She was living in an apartment that was part of a senior living community. On October 29th, Shirley spent the night with Pam after a hospital visit. The following day, Pam dropped Shirley back off and gave the senior center staff a heads up that Shirley wouldn't be coming down for dinner that night or breakfast the following morning. Dang, you trying to starve your mother? The following afternoon, a housekeeper walked in to find the scene. And once officers arrived at the scene, they also found that the railing on Shirley's balcony was broken. The coroner who performed the autopsy on Shirley found evidence of blunt force trauma on her chest, which led them to believe she accidentally fell. The coroner also found a large dose of sedative in her system. And by large, I mean it was like eight times the recommended dose. The following month, police officers got an anonymous tip from someone who said Pam slayed her mom for life insurance money. Hmm, seems to be a trend, doesn't it? So after Shirley's demise, Pam and her siblings got over $120,000 in investments and insurance money. A few months before the event, Pam was caught on video saying, my mom's worth half a million that I get when she dies. If I really wanted money, there was an easier way than trying to combat somebody that's physically stronger than me. By the time the police received the tip, the investigation had already been closed and Shirley's passing was determined accidental. But after this information surfaced, Shirley's case was reopened. Officers talked to the housekeeper and Shirley's son, who both said Shirley was pretty unsteady. So the case remained as accidental and Pam was never pursued as a suspect or even interviewed during the reopening of the case. Okay, Pam must be buddy-buddy with someone on the force because I don't understand how she keeps getting let off the hook like this. And now, let's move on to Pam's third possible victim, Louis Gumpenberger. Talk about a last name to remember. So Louis was a 33 year old man who suffered from severe mental and physical impairments after he got into a really bad car accident in 2005. At 12 10 PM on August 16th, 2016, the local police station got a call for help. Moments later, Pam called 911 and summoned them out to her house. When officers got there, they found Lewis's corpse. He had been whacked with five bullets and the marksman appeared to be Pam. Pam told officers that Lewis, who she described as a random stranger, came up to her in her driveway with a blade and followed her into her home. So she grabbed her Ruger and bam, but things just weren't adding up. Lewis was found with $900 on him, as well as a handwritten note that listed instructions to abduct Pam, get money from Russ, and then slay Pam. So that all sounds like Lewis was hired by Russ to snuff Pam, but that'd be too obvious, right? What person hires a hitman and explicitly writes down the details of the crime? 
That's why investigators quickly realized Pam whacked Lewis and staged the whole thing to make it look like self-defense. They believe Pam somehow got Lewis in her car, drove him to her house, and planted the note, money, and blade before firing at him and calling the cops. Clearly, this ain't Pam's first rodeo. But as much as Pam tried to cover up her role in the crime, evidence began piling against her. <coughs> oh man. Officials pulled her cell phone records where they found out Pam was in Lewis's neighborhood about an hour before he was slain, even though she said she didn't know Lewis at all. The $900 found in Lewis's pocket was in the form of nine $100 bills. When Pam's place was searched, investigators found a $100 bill on her dresser that had a sequential serial number to four of the bills found on Lewis. The blade Lewis was discovered with appeared to have been purchased from a Dollar Tree, and our girl Pam was quite the regular there. Yeah, I don't know how many criminals purchased their tools at Dollar Tree. That had to be a thrifty girl Pam. A carpet swatch was discovered in Pam's home that covered up a portion of her rug that was stained with Lewis's fluid. And it wasn't a mystery that Lewis was executed there, but still, it's sketchy. Another thing to think about is the fact that Lewis's ability to move and think clearly had been hindered since his accident. Due to the state he was in leading up to the incident, detectives didn't think he could have attacked Pam the way she claimed he did. Beyond all of this crazy information, there was something far crazier detectives discovered. Pam pretended to be a Dateline NBC producer named Kathy. Under her fake name, she approached a local woman and told her she was working on a story about 911 calls. This was six days before Lewis's slaying. Kathy slash Pam offered the woman $1,000 to reenact a 911 phone call. This woman agreed to participate at first, but when this Kathy chick wasn't able to show any credentials that she really was this producer, the woman backed out. The woman later identified the fake producer as Pam Hupp, and security footage confirmed her identity as well. Apparently, Pam tried this trick on someone else who didn't fall for it, but Lewis, who was mentally and physically impaired, must have fallen for it. That's how detectives believe Pam lured him into her car that day. It would also make sense for the amount of cash found in Lewis's pocket and on Pam's dresser, because you know, 900 plus 100 equals 1,000. The exact amount offered for this fake Dateline NBC gig. So it is believed Pam did all of this to frame Russ, because right around this time, the whole retrial was going on and Russ's team was blaming Pam for Betsy's demise. On August 23rd, Pam was arrested for the execution of Lewis. Shortly after her arrest, she went to the bathroom and jabbed her wrists and neck a bunch of times with a ballpoint pen in an attempt to end her life. Her attempt was unsuccessful, but it made her seem even more guilty of the crime. Yeah, she hadn't even gone to trial yet, so it's clear she really thought she was gonna be found guilty in court. And that she was. Well, she actually admitted guilt herself because she entered an Alford plea. This meant Pam maintained innocence, but admitted the evidence made her seem guilty. So instead of going through a lengthy trial, she accepted the plea bargain to be sentenced to life in prison and avoid lethal injection. Eh, yeah, that still kind of sounds like she's guilty to me, but I'm no lawyer or judge. After receiving her sentence, Pam called her husband and said the only reason she took the Alfred plea bargain was because she didn't want her family to witness an ugly trial. Girl, that trial was ugly no matter how long it took. It literally involved the demise of an innocent man with brain damage. There's nothing pretty about that. Now I'm gonna add lemon juice and olive oil. Later, Lewis's mom sued Pam for fraud, misrepresentation, and the wrongful execution of her son. 
She apparently asked for a sum in excess of the jurisdictional limits of this court and was eventually given $3 million. Pam remains in jail to this day, where she will stay for the rest of her life. She has still never been pinned to Betsy or Shirley's case as the criminal. Although in 2017, Shirley's COD was changed from accidental to undetermined. Most recently, Pam has filed a motion to vacate her conviction because she said she was pressured to take the plea. Thankfully, her motion was denied, and months later, her husband filed for divorce. He said their marriage is irretrievably broken. Yeah, that's bound to happen when one of the people in the marriage is a raging criminal. Okay, but I just wanna know why Pam was never charged for slaying Betsy. It was so obviously her. Like, what are these prosecutors doing right now? An innocent man just spent years in prison for a horrific crime he didn't commit. And now that he's freed and a new suspect is pinned, they just let it slide? Uh-uh, honey. I hate this chick. But I don't hate this chickpea avocado salad. Thanks for watching.